The film opens up with a scene in 1961. NASA test pilot Neil Armstrong is flying the X-15 rocket-powered space plane, struggling to manage it in the atmosphere. He thrusts it upwards, and the ship heats as it gains altitude. The engine halts as he pierces the atmosphere, and is above the Earth. He notes the altitude, and the ship descends. Instead of turning, the ship starts to balloon, and altitude rises again. He's bouncing off the atmosphere. Before he can escape Earth's gravity, he uses the thrusters on the wing to manage his turn, and manages to land the shaking plane in the Mojave Desert. His colleagues appear to extract him. Chuck expresses concern that his recent record of mishaps is due to distraction, but Joe thinks he just got bounced, but he made the landing still. But Chuck says this is his third mishap in a month, and he should be punished. His two-year-old daughter, Karen, is undergoing treatment for a brain tumor, while he and his wife watch. Back home, she's vomiting and crying while Neil comforts her, trying to distract her with toys and lullabies. Desperate to save her, Armstrong keeps a detailed log of her symptoms in his room and researches possible treatments. He wants to go to Dr. Harold Johns in Canada, who has developed a specific treatment. Joe comes over to Neil's house and tells him that Dick Day from Houston called about Neil for the Gemini project, which needs expert engineers and pilots. But Neil declines till Karen gets better. Karen dies soon afterward. After lowering her coffin, he breaks down in his room, and the next day decides to return to work. At the office, he's doing desk duty when Joe tells him that he should return home. He says he's okay and wants to work on the new Delta Wing in the UK, but is informed that Beekle cancelled the trip and wants a report on his latest mishap. Grief-stricken and suspecting he has been grounded, Armstrong sees the ad for Project Gemini and applies for it. At the selection program, he meets another civilian named Elliot, who befriends him, and they discuss the difficulty of passing the ice bath. He has an interview where he mentions the benefits of parking the main ship in orbit and sending a smaller shuttle towards the moon's surface, despite the challenges, which include navigating on the moon and rendezvous. They ask him about the importance of spaceflight, and he talks about how being outside the Earth's atmosphere influenced his perspective of their place in the universe. They then ask him if the death of his daughter would influence his flight, and Neil says it's unreasonable to assume it wouldn't a little. The interviewers dismiss him. Back home during dinner, he receives a call, informing him of his acceptance to NASA astronaut Group 2. They celebrate it as a fresh start. With his wife Janet and their son Rick, Armstrong moves to Houston. We see a small demonstration of the Gemini Project's proposed plan of sending a smaller shuttle to the lunar surface. As Armstrong begins training, Deke Slayton impresses upon the new astronauts seated in a classroom the importance of the Gemini program. As the Soviet Union had reached every milestone in the space race ahead of the United States, which compelled them to choose the most difficult job. He shows a demonstration of the scale on a blackboard and explains their next mission, which is to land on the moon. Back home, Ed White's wife introduces themselves to Janet. She's pregnant with their third child. They walk into the multi-axis trainer facility, which simulates the kind of role coupling they might encounter in space. They have to stabilize the machine before passing out. Neil walks in first and is strapped to the machine. He tries to maintain focus while stabilizing it, as it grows faster. He passes out and thinks of his deceased daughter. Neil wakes up, and Ed White is about to take his place. But Neil says he wants to go for a second round. He fails again. We see him vomiting. Ed enters the restroom, and he too vomits. Back in the classroom, they're all nauseous as the teacher goes over basic rocket physics, which turns out to be 600 pages long. Neil returns home at night and sees his second son, Mark, asleep. He discusses the lecture with his wife, which, although contrary to what he learned at his pilot school, makes sense mathematically. His wife is happy about his enthusiasm. We cut to 1965. Ed, Elliot, and Neil's families are having dinner together while their children play. Janet mentions a musical Neil wrote in his college called The Land of Eagleock by writing the word college backward. They all laugh. Outside, the men are discussing the possibility of Ed pioneering the first extravehicular activity, EVA. Ed receives a call from D and notices something on the news. The Soviets have completed the first EVA which was a major landmark for the Americans. Back at the launch complex, Deke introduces Neil to Buzz Aldrin and Roger Chaffee. He then privately informs him that he will command Gemini 8, with David Scott as the pilot. Back home, the families celebrate Neil's promotion. Pat and Janet discuss childhood memories. It starts raining. Ed asks Janet to see Neil. She invites him inside, but he refuses to, preferring to wait outside. When Neil walks over, he gives him the bad news and informs him that Elliot and Charles Bassett were killed in a T-38 crash. He walks in, grief-stricken, and his wife understands. At Elliot's funeral, Buzz Aldrin criticizes Elliot's approach as the cause of his death. 
The others are appalled, but he insists that Deke was doubtful of his ability and moved him off of Gemini 8. Neil silences him by saying that because he wasn't piloting the plane, he wouldn't pretend to know what really happened. Inside, Neil remembers the death of his daughter Karen, which overwhelms him. He asks his wife to leave, but when she refuses to, he leaves alone. Janet takes a ride back with Pat and asks if Neil's ever talked about Karen, but he hasn't. Back home, Neil is staring at the moon in his backyard. Ed tries to tell him to go back inside and comfort his wife and children, but Neil rudely dismisses him. We then cut to Armstrong and Scott getting into Gemini 8. David's belt doesn't lock, which causes them concern, but Pete cleans it with a Swiss army knife and locks David in. They start the engine, but Neil is distracted by a bee and the noise of metal clanking. They grow nervous as the rocket lifts off. After much struggle, they leave the atmosphere. Back home, Janet listens to Neil's progress on the radio, while journalists take photographs of their family. They momentarily lose visual on Agena and ask Houston Mission Control for help. They perform the calculations and communicate the route to the ship. Mark takes away Janet's radio, and Janet asks him to return it. Neil performs his own calculation, makes another burn, closes all the lights, and finds a possible visual on Agena. They find it, and the docking is successful. Back home, Janet struggles with her children. Soon after the docking, a malfunction causes the spacecraft to roll at an increasingly dangerous rate. They try to shut down Agena's control system, to no avail. They undock with the Agena, which causes their shuttle to launch at an even faster speed. Houston Mission Control cuts off radio communication, leaving Janet unaware of Neil's fate. Neil struggles with the ship. He asks David to close the RCS thrusters, but he's passed out. After nearly blacking out, Armstrong closes the RCS thrusters and controls the roll. Back at Houston Mission Control, they're discussing emergency landing options. Janet appears for an explanation, and they tell her that Neil is fine, and the ship is under control. They tell her to go home, but Janet refuses to until they turn on the radio. She accuses them of being immature and walks away. Back in the ship, Armstrong sees the Agena fly away and asks if there's anything they forgot. David thinks they didn't make any mistakes. At the post-mission press conference, they deem the mission a success, despite the malfunction. At mission evaluation, George Muller asks Neil to justify separating from the Agena. Neil replies that back then, they didn't know the issue was with their own ship, and assumed Agena was rotating, which caused them to detach from it. At home, Neil is angry at the way journalists have written about his mission. Janet discusses his anger with Pat, who tells him that Ed didn't move for weeks after Gemini 4. Janet talks about how she married Neil to have a normal life. Pat tells her about her sister who is married to a dentist and has a normal life. Her husband arrives home by 6 in the evening, but she wishes he didn't. Ed, Neil, and David discuss their recent adventure over beers. Ed reveals that he has been selected for the Apollo 1 mission, along with Gus Grissom and Roger Chaffee. They congratulate him as being potentially the first man on the moon. The next morning, Bob tells Neil that NASA has considered their mission a success, despite the loss of Agena, and their mission pushed them ahead towards Apollo. He then asks Armstrong to represent NASA at the White House. Back home, Neil plays with his children. At night, Ed and Neil take a walk while Ed talks about how his Apollo mission has inspired his son. But Neil seems distracted and, for the first time, mentions Karen before walking back home. We cut to a launch rehearsal test of Apollo 1 on January 27, 1967. The crew is strapped in. Meanwhile, Armstrong is at an event in the White House, trying to justify the funding. He gets a call from Deke Slayton, informing him that an accidental fire killed Ed and the Apollo 1 crew. He advises Armstrong to return to the hotel since the press and the Congress will be investigating this soon, and they'll be caught in the midst. Armstrong, grief-stricken, cracks the glass in his grip. The Apollo flight is postponed. The next year, Armstrong is recklessly piloting a lunar landing research vehicle when he barely ejects from a crash that could have killed him. He parachutes to the ground and is dragged by it for some time. Deke and Bob tell Neil that the vehicle is dangerous, but Neil says it's the best one they have. They argue that it could have almost killed him, and they need to worry about individual lives and political fallout, but Neil thinks it's too late for that. At home, Janet is distracted by a protest against Lyndon B. Johnson. She looks outside and sees Pat standing absent-mindedly. She walks over to her, asks her if she's okay, and takes her inside. Neil returns home. The family notices the wound on his face and asks what happened, but he dismisses them by saying he left something at the office and leaves again. Meanwhile, the people protest the decision to prioritize space travel over their economy, while the work on the Apollo 11 rocket continues. Slayton informs Armstrong that he has been selected to command Apollo 11, which will likely attempt the first lunar landing. Back home, Janet is upset at Neil's obsession with the moon landing. 
Neil becomes increasingly preoccupied and emotionally distant from his family. At a press conference, he gives direct answers to the journalists, while Buzz tries to make jokes to lighten the situation. While he packs for the mission, Janet confronts Armstrong about his neglect of his family. Neil dismisses her, which infuriates Janet, and she locks him in the office. She confronts him about the possibility that he might not survive the flight, and insists that he explain the risks of the mission to their young sons. They get together in the dining room. After telling them about the risks he faces, Armstrong says goodbye to his family. Bob and Deke go over the speech to deliver, in case the mission fails and the astronauts die. The crew reaches NASA. They share a brief lunch before preparing themselves for the launch. They enter the cockpit and the rocket launches in smoke and fire. After some struggle with the Earth's atmosphere, they leave the orbit and float into space. They listen to music as they voyage closer to the moon. Three days after launch, Apollo 11 enters lunar orbit. They get a visual of the lunar surface. Mike grows nervous and asks incessant questions, but Neil brings him back. Armstrong and Aldrin undock in the lunar module Eagle, leaving the remaining crew behind and begin the landing. The Eagle module shows a repeated 1202 alarm, which they don't understand and dismiss, which gives them a 1201 alarm. They dismiss it too. The landing site terrain turns out to be much rougher than expected, forcing Armstrong to take manual control of the spacecraft. He lands the Eagle successfully at an alternative site with less than 30 seconds of fuel remaining. Buzz congratulates Neil. After setting foot on the moon, Armstrong describes the surface of the moon as being like powder. He places his foot on it and utters his famous line, that's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. While sightseeing, he thinks back to his memories with Karen. Later, he drops Karen's bracelet into Little West Crater. With their mission complete, the astronauts return home, while the world rejoices in their success. They are placed in quarantine, where they watch footage of John F. Kennedy's 1962 speech, we choose to go to the moon on television. While Janet goes to meet Neil, she's ambushed by journalists. She is taken to a room by Deke where she talks with Neil through a glass wall and they share a moment of tenderness.